right welcome back everyone any of you feel that you might want to come forward um we've got a slightly more intimate meeting and it's my absolute delight and pleasure to interview i'm sorry to introduce i'd love to interview julie i think i probably have done that a few times <laughs> Julie Flygar, JD, is the president and CEO of Project Sleep and the award-winning author of Wide Awaking Dreaming, a memoir of narcolepsy. Since receiving a diagnosis of narcolepsy with cataplexy in 2007, Julie advanced her leadership in the sleep and healthcare space through speaking engagements, publications, and media collaborations and advocacy and awareness initiatives. Julie received her BA from Brown University in 2005, JD from Boston College Law School in 2009, focusing on health law, policy, and rare disease drug development. On March 22nd, 2022, she delivered the TEDx talk, What Can You Learn from a Professional Dreamer? There is so much more I could say about Julie, uh, but she, she speaks for herself, so thank you. Thank you so much, Claire, and thanks for everyone for being here. Um, I have to admit that Claire somehow convinced me to take on a new topic today, so I'm really excited, but you are my first audience. Um, my bio does not actually mention that I was an art history major in college, so um, here is a photo of me at the Brown University Library. Um, this was a course I took on maps, and um, I got really into it, and um, so, I, yeah, I just really remember loving this class on maps and visual representations of, of space and everything like that. But today we have a different topic, um, which is uh, sleep and art. It's a huge, huge topic, as I've learned. There's so much there. Um, and so for me today, I really focus this on elements of art that resonated with me and my experience um, and what I hear from the community as far as um, how sleep uh, impacts our lives as people with narcolepsy and IH. Um, so this will certainly not be your full sleep and art course. Uh, it'll be a little bit more focused to certain areas that, I, that resonated with me. So I'm going to start a little bit by talking about uh, a concept that I really learned about from a book called Wild Nights, which is a fantastic book um, about certain elements of the history of sleep and culture. And there was a big section on religious control of sleep. Uh, so I, I realize this isn't the hugest art history example, but I think it's important background uh, for the talk. And um, it that talked about uh, the culture of, of congregations in, especially in uh, the US, but also in the UK, and how um, <laughs> the uh, priests were having a hard time getting parishioners to stay awake in church. It can be kind of boring, right? Um, and so um, they were having a hard time. So they kind of really talked about people falling asleep in church as a really big sin. So here's a quote from um, this guy, a mather, who said, uh, if thou dost find thyself inclined to sleep under the hearing of the word, think how Satan is busy about thee. Okay, so if you fall asleep in church, Satan's uh, coming into you. <laughs> I'd just like to point out that Increase Mather was uh, a really prominent figure, actually, at the North Church of Boston, and he ended up becoming president of Harvard University. Um, we have another guy here who was one of the founders of Methodism, uh, and he was saying, oversleeping sows the seeds of foolish and hurtful desires. It dangerously inflames our natural appetites. It breeds sloth. It totally unfits us for enduring hardship as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. So an interesting element I did read about, I didn't think about, is that um, a lot of these um, religions were also felt like they were competing with newer segments of religion. And um, the newer segments were often having their meetings um, privately at night. So um, they were kind of saying that if people came to their congregation sleepy, it's because maybe they were going to the competing um, sex at night and then coming in sleepy. So there's even an element of that as like competition with other religious seg um, segments. So, um, so falling asleep in church was really a huge sin. Um, and here's just a, a kind of comedic um, portrayal of that from the UK, actually, um, from William Hogarth, who was a, a really um, popular um, 
set, he's doing a lot of satire. So he's showing the congregation falling asleep there. Um, another element that I really learned a lot about from the book Wild Nights is about sleep deprivation and slavery. Um, and there's a fantastic chapter, chapter where he talks about really controlling sleep as a weapon that one group can use against another group, in this case, against enslaved people. And um, uh, the, it talks about the really rough sleeping environments, often on clay floors, uh, not even in beds. Um, and Frederick Douglass, actually, in his autobiography, dedicates several pages to talking about um, the sleep deprivation uh, for enslaved people. So he has this quote, more slaves were whipped for oversleeping than for any other fault. And so they worked really long days, which obviously led to them feeling weary, dull, faint, heavy, and sleepy. Um, and then uh, Solomon Northrup in 12 Years a Slave talks about that there were no regular periods of rest, only a few moments of sleep at, at a time. Um, and uh, you know, there were descriptions basically that if you weren't up at the first, um, I forget what it was like a bell or a whistle, you know, if you weren't up and out, then that's when they were whipping people for, um, oversleeping. So they're both sleep deprived and, um, sleepy. Um, I just put another element of sleeping in church. Did, you know, did this kind of, uh, perception of sleeping in church change? No, here is a much later depiction. Uh, that ended up being the cover of the Saturday Evening Post of a man um, falling asleep in church. And I'm assuming that's his wife or something being like, oh my God, how dare you? Um, as the money baskets being brought around. All right, so um, I'm gonna change elements a little bit to talk about representations of sleep um, and sleepiness. Um, this really resonated with me. But, Again, there's a lot to go from, from the history of art history, but this uh, depiction by Salvador Dali called Sleep uh, was something that I just emotionally resonated with me as a person with narcolepsy. Here, this face is being held up by crutches. Um, I don't know if you can notice, but even in the corner of the dog is being held up by crutches. And apparently Dali used crutches a lot as a signal of fragility of the support that maintains reality. Um, and just seeing the eye being held up by a crutch uh, and just the facial expression just resonates with me with a sense of sleepiness. So he has a lot of other, obviously surrealism has a lot of other, uh, you know, there's a lot of surreal paintings that he did, but uh, this one was the one that resonated the most with me. Um, so here's a, uh, an earlier work called Flaming June. And I tried to look for pictures of sleep that made me feel inclined towards thinking sleep would be okay, like a good thing. And Flaming June is just one that I think is so beautiful and makes me feel that rest is acceptable, you know, calming. Um, and so it was interesting to learn about this work. It's a very big work. It's four feet, just the painting itself, never mind the uh, frame it's in. And it was very popular when it was first made. And, um, and uh, it's, but interestingly, apparently there was two different women that saw, sat as models for this painting. And uh, they couldn't stay in that position very long because apparently it's not actually a very comfortable position to even sit in for a very short period of time. Uh, so they would switch between them. And uh, so, it, but I think it's just kind of like ends up showing this kind of elongated body and uh, really focused on obviously the, the draped material. And uh, it just ends up being a very serene image. It doesn't actually portray anything. There's no story about some person named June or something. Uh, and that's really actually what Leighton was really into was a sense of um, having no narrative behind the story. So um, you can interpret it what you'd like, but there's no flaming June story <laughs> uh, to back it up. But I think it's just one of the images that makes me think sleep is nice. <laughs> Um, to talk a little bit about dreams and nightmares, uh, this is an obviously really popular image I'm sure you guys have all seen called The Nightmare um, by Fuseli, and really I think strongly represents hypnagogic hallucinations and sleep paralysis experiences. Uh, the word nightmare 
uh, you know, I'm sure you guys are familiar, actually really probably comes from more of a hypnagogic hallucination experience. Mare is a word for horse in a lot of languages, almost like a horse um, being ridden by a horse. Uh, and so, and then also you have this little demon sitting on her chest. So this is a popular one, to be honest. Uh, it doesn't really resonate with my own personal hallucination experiences, but uh, you'll often see this, right? So I felt like I had to include it. But um, just talking about dreaming in different ways that people represent dreaming, this is actually around the same time as that Fuseli painting. Uh, this is a work called Dreaming of a Mouse's Wedding. And what's really interesting about how people per portray dreaming is do you display the person and the dream? Do you display just the dreamer? Do you display just the dream? How do you incorporate both? And um, this is kind of a pretty literal, you know, you see the kind of like thing coming out and it's pretty clear that obviously that's an image coming from that person's head. Um, so apparently it's a courtesan in training and she's dreaming of um, a better life. Apparently that's what the interpretation was by a mouse's wedding. I don't really get that, but, um, but I, I just, it's very kind of, obvious representation of a dream. This is one I thought was really neat called Dream and Reality. And it has these two older people, obviously, um, who are all kind of wrapped in heavy material. And it's pretty hard to see, but I think you can see it somewhat in the middle. You can see their kind of combined dream of them together. They're younger, they're wearing light clothing, they're standing on a balcony together and I just, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm just a romantic, but um, I just love that idea of like a, a shared dream coming together like that and kind of a neat representation of dreams. Uh, very different, but uh, Frida Kahlo has a lot of surrealist elements, of course. And uh, this one really struck me as somewhat more um, interesting and thinking about hypnagogic hallucinations and sleep paralysis and, you know, kind of like figures in my space. Uh, and uh, this one, I guess, for Frida Kahlo was more about, uh, apparently she actually had a skeleton in her bedroom and uh, it was to remind her of, um, you know, that death could come at any time and to live your life. Uh, and that, uh, you know, so that's, and I think that's why there's even explosives that are uh, set up around the skeleton that it, everything could explode and your life could be over, I guess. Uh, so to appreciate life while you have it. But for me, I guess I just thought it was um, an interesting um, having another figure in the room sort of representation. So I don't know if that resonates with people, but also want to include a woman in this presentation because, you know. Um, so some more recent, uh, projects, this is something I found a few years ago that I think is really neat. I don't know if anyone's seen this in person. I have not, but it's in New York city and now in Berlin called projection napping where they, um, uh, project these, uh, videos of people. It's very site specific. So you can see the people look like they're leaning within, you know, the contours of the space, um, right. That's, um, that the buildings or the billboards or, or, you know, they're fitting into that space. So the thing that I really like about that, of course, is that New York City is supposed to be the, the you know, place where no one sleeps. Um, but this project has really been about um, these visual, very huge representations of people sleeping. Um, I love the work of Kahande Wiley, uh, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it in person. This is huge. This is massive. This is not life size. This is monumental size um, painting called Sleeping. And um, a lot of his work is really focused on black and uh, black men and women in classical poses, ornately decorated backgrounds situations that we often saw a lot of white people, um, you know, in, um, but, uh, you know, so there's both an element of the past and historical rep representation, but also quite modern too in his design. So, um, you know, this is kind of ambiguous. I have read a lot about it and everyone can have their theory. And I guess it's the way the artists do these things. They kind of leave it up to you to interpret. Uh, so there's no one exact interpretation, but it's not clear you know, um, is this person alive? Are they dead? Because of course, sleep and death have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of intertwined history in art as well. 
Um, but, uh, and then of course there's a, um, let's see, I have a little, the, his, the feet are against this um, wooden board. And so there's kind of an element of thinking that is it like, it's almost like a Jesus Christ representation, but um, on the cross, but this person is not, there's no nails, you know, there's nothing like that. Um, but I just, I mean, the elements of how the hand lays so beautifully and um, the detail. Uh, and then of course, these really cool ornate um, modern kind of like floral elements um, come together to be something really beautiful. So um, I'd love, to, I actually have seen some of his work in person, but I haven't seen any of the ones that are about sleeping. Uh, here's another one uh, of his work, um, Ariande sleeping on the island of Naxos. Um, and this is another representation, this old story. Um, I kind of forget. It's a story where basically like, I don't know, she like saves some guy. Um, she like helps some guy get through a maze to kill some monster. And then, um, and then they're on their way to this Island or they get to this nice Island together. And then the guy abandons her. Okay. And then she's left. And then, um, the God of wine, I think he shows up and they get married. So, um, this has been a story apparently that's, you know, obviously there were a lot of representations from the Greeks and the Romans. Um, but of course, uh, always white people. So, um, Kahunde here made this beautiful representation, um, of a black woman, uh, and it's just very serene. And I think what's people talk about is both that she's both powerful, but very vulnerable. And I think that really resonated with me as someone that has to feel vulnerable in sleep. Um, and, um, you know, but I like to think, I'd like to think of myself as her, maybe still powerful while I sleep. So I promised Claire there were no nudes um, in my presentation, um, uh, but I kept one um, because here is, because <laughs> it was hard. Um, a lot, oh, so yeah, a lot of art history uh, and sleep is intertwined with just like objectifying women laying, sleeping, like naked. So, um, sorry, I left most of that out of my presentation, but I did want to say like, uh, even Kahunde says that this was really inspired by uh, this painting by uh, this guy, this um, Russian guy, Victor. So I put it in there so you could see the original of what he was kind of transforming into um, a black representation. Um, black Power Naps is a really cool initiative by uh, two artists, Navalid Costa and Sosa. Uh, and they really talk about the history um, of enslaved people in our country. Uh, and they say, they ask the question, how can we dream if we don't sleep? Woo! <laughs> Um, and they trace the history of, of the cultural perceptions of sleep as laziness, especially in the black culture, um, and, you know, trying to claim back the power of rest, um, which is also something I'm sure you guys are familiar, familiar with, um, the nap ministry, which is another, um, really wonderful voice, um, to talk about claiming rest as, re as resistance. And so um, I haven't seen these in person, but um, you know, they apparently they, they described that they create these spaces, uh, these installations that are almost like being on a ship, uh, rocking you to sleep with mattresses um, and hand dyed fabrics and um, projections on the wall. So it sounds really comfy and cozy and I'd love to go to, to see one of these um, installations. So here are some images. I really am glad for contemporary art because I really tried to look throughout history and find things that um, resonated with my experience. And I had a harder time until you get to some current day stuff. Um, I don't know. I found this random painting called Waking Up and I just thought it resonated possibly with an experience of feeling like you're not yourself when you wake up um, and that he's eating breakfast looking at his face. <laughs> um, so... I'm just really glad, you know, this is something if you've attended some of our broadcasts, um, I love this Akut Agudu. Um, it's a Turkish artist uh, and, you know, this feeling of having two heads, one asleep and one awake, just really powerful um, or having your face feel like it's somehow behind your face. Um, I could, I mean, I could show you his whole collection because I think so much of it is, you know, this feeling of being washed over or brain fog, um, some other ones, eyes on fire. Anyone else ever felt like their eyes are on fire? 
um, or their head just kind of like uh, becoming liquid. So um, there's just so much cool stuff out there now. And I just focus on a few um, of my favorites. Uh, this artist um, in, um, I believe it's China, um, has a series called Lucid Dream 2. And I really wonder if this person has a sleep disorder because, um, you know, some of what they show here, your brain feeling like uh, it's been a demolition zone or this person fighting you in your own head. It's just really powerful to me. Uh, here's some more from it, feeling like your face is like, I don't know what being held up this way. So, um, you know, a lot of time has gone by and uh, I started of course with talking about religious control of sleep and, you know, old times, old times. So have our perceptions of sleep changed? Are we all empowered and we all think that sleep is great for us? Here's an example from uh, the Australian organization. I was in Australia this past March, uh, and this is an artist who did an installation where he actually had 180 people come in and to the to the museum and kind of do some confessionals about a lot, you know, whatever, whatever you think is your secrets. <laughs> so I was actually really surprised how many of these things had to do with sleep. I mean, we're talking your biggest confessionals. There's some big confessions in here. Um, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of big, there's heavy stuff in here. And how did sleep make it to the top of some of this? So here are just some examples. I have afternoon naps. God forbid. <laughs> um, sometimes I don't want to get out of bed. I tell my friends I go to bed at eight, but really I go at nine. <laughs> I just couldn't believe that still, you know, um, that still in 2000, I guess I can, but unfortunately we still have a long way to go that we still have a judgment around sleep. And I think it probably goes back to those, you know, um, those original, you know, people being afraid you're gonna fall, in, fall asleep in church. So let's, let's pretend that the devil's entering you when you sleep in church. Um, I'm sure it comes from a lot of different places, right? Or our history with slavery, so. Um, Okay, just a quick story uh, <laughs> about how I wrote a book and I really focus so much, of course, on telling my story in words. Uh, and then you get to the end of the experience and you start to realize you need a cover for a book, okay? And you think, oh, no one should judge a book by a cover, but come on, everyone judges the book by a cover. So um, I found a, uh, a cover of a lupus memoir I really liked. It really kind of uh, stuck, stuck in my head. So I, I asked the, I knew the advocate with lupus that had written the book. She was kind of, you know, helping me with my whole experience writing a memoir because she'd done it. Um, and so I asked her for her designer she'd worked with. The designer lived in Argentina. So I contacted her. We did this like Oh, this filling out this paperwork about, you know, what elements, visual elements resonate, blah, blah, blah. She sent back some early drafts and they were bad. Okay. Um, so I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Around that same time, one of my best friends, which was um, a fellow art history major, uh, Melissa here, uh, we took all of our art history classes together. We kept each other awake in the library often by giving each other back massages because it was... And then we'd like study together and like quiz each other. Um, back when I was undiagnosed in college, um, she was a huge part of my experience. And fast forward to, uh, this would have been 2012. Uh, she was, she'd lived the art history dream. She was doing kind of what I thought was not possible. She was a curator at a museum in San Francisco, traveling around the world, bringing, you know, Van Goghs and vans across France, you know, doing this really cool stuff. And, uh, she gave me this uh, print uh, and it was called Dreaming. And it was by a woman that worked in the gift shop at the museum where she worked in San Francisco. And she said that it resonated for her because we had five best friends in college. And so we held each other up. And I thought that was so beautiful, but I also saw that image and it, had, it was titled Dreaming. And I thought, oh my God, like, I just love how it's holding the body up. So 
I sent it to the graphic designer in Argentina and I said, there's something about this, but I don't know if the artist will let us use it or, you know, whatever. So I asked my friend, Melissa, who contacted her friend in the gift shop who made the, you know, the whole thing. And, um, and the artist actually said that, and I had to be like, Hey, I love your art. Would you mind if it's on the cover of a memoir about narcolepsy? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I was kind of awkward. I didn't know her. And she wrote back and uh, she said that uh, she actually was told her mom about it. And her mom said, you know, your grandmother had narcolepsy and she had passed away when she was younger, but she had narcolepsy with cataplexy uh, where she was actually like had a hard time cooking sometimes because uh, of her muscle loss. And so it actually became quite personal for the artist to help me, um, you know, use her image for my cover. So I did ask her to redo the image slightly. Let's see if we can go back. Um, I wanted long hair <laughs> and the boobs were a little pointy. <laughs> so those are two of the changes. Uh, so she ended up uh, doing a, here you can see it. So there's a, she did a, a drawing, like a, just a black and white drawing. Um, she actually ended up adding a balloon. So there's six balloons. Um, and then we sent a high resolution photo of the new drawing with the hair and the less pointy boobs um, to the graphic designer in Argentina. And uh, so then she kind of came back with some of these things. And I was still like, oh, geez, I don't know. But there was something about the middle one, right? And there was something about the thing on the right with the dark background. So you know, eventually it came together into a cover that uh, if you judge my book by its cover, then I am so happy. <laughs> so um, I just want to do a little community spotlight uh, because one of my things is there's so much more that can be done with visual representations. I honestly think the history of art has left a lot to be desired. Um, and so I'm so grateful for, um, you know, artists that are from our community um, that are looking for new, interesting ways to visualize their experience. So this is Shu from Japan. And he talks about how, um, for him, this painting represents the fear of memories being sliced out. It expresses the anxiety of shaking vision, the uncomfortable feeling of being under someone's gaze. So he uses, he uses this glitch art and photography and apps to help visualize more about his experience with narcolepsy. Um, and yeah, also a huge shout out to the Hypersomnia Foundation for hosting a t-shirt contest. I think that's amazing um, because we need our artists. We need you um, to be making art that represents your experience. Here are just a few resources. Um, the Sleep in Art book um, by Dr. Krieger is incredible. Um, and really, I've used a few examples from his book here, but there's so much more there. If you're not familiar with Museum of Sleep, it's a great uh, Instagram account. They hope to have someday a museum, physical museum. Um, I did a great interview with them this past uh, sleep in. Uh, they're in Richmond, Virginia. And of course, um, Tatiana is a wonderful artist from our community. We did an art workshop together and um, an interview this past sleep in as well. So you can see that. Um, we have a narcolepsy and brain fog toolkit that includes some of these great representations along with an interview with Dr. Maskey about brain fog. Um, and our narcolepsy and art toolkit features, I think six or seven different artists with narcolepsy from around the world, um, including Shu, who I just showed you, and Dana from Israel and artists from across uh, the US. And um, we also have our sleep disorders toolkit for journalists. I almost forgot to include that, but uh, in there we try to talk to journalists about representations uh, and we give suggestions for some more creative ways of representing sleepiness, as opposed to sort of like, if you Google, you know, uh, narcolepsy or IH, I'm not sure for IH, but for narcolepsy is often like someone asleep over a laptop. I'm actually, I mean, fine. I'm just bored of the image. Let's just, you know, have some more creativity and, and diversity of, of images of what sleepiness feels like. Um, one thing I wish I could have shown more was representations of what it means to feel like from behind the eyes of someone with sleepiness. What does that fog look like outward? Um, I tried to Google around. I mean, I guess you could say impressionism is a cool way of kind of showing somewhat of a more, you know, foggy environment, but I didn't really see as much out there as I'd like. So um, I hope that that could be an interesting area of trying to visualize to show people the world from behind our eyes it would be something that'd be really cool.
So um, that's what I have. So thank you guys. <laughs> bit of a darker topic i've been getting into horror movies lately Ooh. um and mm. i've found that personally um a lot of representations and horror films of like hauntings and things like that i've been watching it and saying mm -hmm. that's narcolepsy mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm narcolepsy type one with cataplexy and uh, a lot of these representations that include like um the exhaustion nightmares sleepiness like hallucinations mm -hmm. and whatnot I, I was watching it and just being like Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> this this rep yeah. this weird like sl it's not sleep disorder representation exactly, but it feels like an almost accidental representation of these things. I yeah. guess as a sort of general question concept, mm -hmm. I almost wonder if looking into horror and the horror of sleep, since horror exposes the yeah. true you know things that we as a society and as a culture are afraid of mm -hmm. if really looking into the horror of sleep might be a useful uh, avenue in terms of artistic representation yeah. of sleepiness and well, sleep disorders like that. we might have to get you on that case because horror movies scare me and, <laughs> and oh, they're scary I, for a reason <laughs> and i think they feed into my hallucinations so i avoid them um and so it wouldn't be something i would take on but i totally agree um and yeah so and also just film and narcolepsy i will be talking about sleep in hollywood on wednesday day um, of the meeting. So uh, there's a lot to be said about film uh, in good ways and bad ways, a lot of bad ways. Um, but uh, that that is so true because even what we've looked at so far is when people, more character portrayals where you say this person has narcolepsy or the word narcolepsy is mentioned. Um, but what is so neat about those is often the more like curiosity or like you said, feeding into the fears um, and it probably some things that really resonate with experience, even though they're not saying the word narcolepsy. So yeah, I think we talked about some of those um, neat representations in our hypnagogic hallucinations and sleep paralysis broadcast, um, things from Stranger Things um, and Harry Potter maybe. What else, Taylor? Well, remember she made the toolkit, <laughs> but there's a lot of really, oh, um, and, uh, Billie Eilish uh, has a whole album that seems like, you know, about like a lot of hypnagogic hallucinations and stuff like that. So there's a lot of cool stuff out there, but yeah, you'll have to do the project on the horror. Oh, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Tatiana uh, that you showed her. So I did a blog post picturing narcolepsy and I didn't have any pictures. It was how I pictured it in my mind. Three years later, I had them do paintings for me, which I've got 18 of them. Uh, which I have in like a coffee table book uh, that I always carry around with me, except for today. But, you know, support your, your artists. They, they are awesome. You get people with like Matt over there sitting mm -hmm. a couple tables away. Mm -hmm. He does stuff with rocks and people with narcolepsy or IH and, and KLS. They're some of the most creative people I know. Mm -hmm. So thanks for Tatiana and yeah. everybody else that does artwork. All right. Thank you. Um, as Julie said, that was a first presentation of its kind that she's done, and so you heard it here first. Uh, I think um, there'll be many, many people who will want to hear that and see those images because they're so expansive and inspiring. So thank you for bringing that perspective uh, to this weekend, which is otherwise pretty heavy with data um, and graphs and pie charts. So that was really refreshing. Thank you. <laughs>